Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, Gordon. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. I am really excited to have you here. I recently exited my own business in the maritime technology space, and so I know this area very well. I know the challenges. I know the potential because we are talking about an industry that is still juggling Excel spreadsheets and sending dozens of email just to book one job. So technology can potentially revolutionize shipping, and you and I have been talking about doing this episode for years and I'm just excited to have you on the show finally and get into what exactly Nishex is bringing to the industry. But before we talk about Nishex in more detail, tell us about your journey from working all across the world from Maersk to co-founding Nishex. What did you learn along the way and what made you want to start your own business? Yeah, happy to go into that. So the the, the origin story is I, I joined Maersk straight after university and I grew up in South Africa, went to university in South Africa and actually was always fascinated by the shipping industry and had studied economics and law and then specialized in maritime economics and maritime law, which I thought was a lot of fun um, and had a wonderful time at Maersk, joined as part of their management program. They, they used to call it the Mesa Trade program back in the day uh, and we just... Uh, wonderful opportunity to see the world to understand an industry that i think is fascinating and really get exposure to all different elements of the business and so that's been the the sort of the journey that i was on with Maersk and you know the the, the lead into nishex and how that all began is you know quite frankly quite early in my career at Maersk, we were dealing with some uh, i think it was booking rollings at some point we had to call up some customers and tell them sorry we couldn't load them on the ship because the right. ship was full and um I uh, started to just question, like, well, why is the ship full? Why did we have to roll these customers? And, and of course, you start to realize very quickly that in our industry, even though contracts get signed, agreements get made, the, the practice is just not to take them as seriously as what they probably would in other industries. And then, of course, you know, the, this is very early in my career. Um, and having a background in law, you you know, you, you get taught that a contract, you know, it just seems almost like an anomaly, an anomaly to call a contract a two-way committed contract, because by definition, the contract requires sort of quid pro quo and some form of like performance or what have you, or delivery. And um, so that was, for me, really, really frustrating and almost a, a head scratcher. But again, industries are that what they are, and it takes many years to sort of create these industry norms. And you know, it didn't take away from my ability to enjoy the industry. But for me, what really happened that was interesting is I was ultimately based in Chicago and we had a, uh, at, at Maersk at the time, we had a customer that said, look, our business is completely flat, no seasonality. It's basically fuses that go into production lines and everything else. And so um, you can basically set your clock to the production process and you can set your clock to the consumption of these fuses and these production lines, automotive and other things. Um, so the, the ask was just provide a consistent service and a fixed rate and um, oh. let's just sort of move on on that basis. And so we, we sort of quoted on that business and we got it and everything seemed so fantastic because it was quite beneficial to have that type of cargo compared to yeah. normal cargo, which has got lots of seasonality. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, um, you know, the market started to change and suddenly what we thought was an attractive freight rate suddenly wasn't such an attractive freight rate. And then suddenly it wasn't so easy to get those containers loaded on the ship. And I think we all know how these things can, can go sideways quickly. Mm -hmm. but, and that was just a real, real sort of frustration for me that, you know, we could have a, a customer at the time who was, you know, had this consistent business. All they wanted was a consistent price, consistent service, and it was hard yeah. for us to be able to deliver that. So anyway, that, that was frustrating. And um, I also spent three years at SAB Miller, which is now part of the AB InBev group. Um, that was fascinating. But for me, I'd always assumed that the way that the shipping industry worked was kind of, um, you know, cost of doing business for carriers. And mostly the cost was on the carrier shoulders because the carriers were the ones that had to deal with the empty container ships and right. containers stuck out of position when they were supposed to be moving forward, et cetera. Uh, and I didn't quite realize how damaging these things can be on the flip side when you're a shipper. So when I spent my time at SAB Miller, which again, such a fantastic company and had so much opportunity to learn different things, but I also got to spend time with the um, shipping and logistics team and understanding, you know, what happens when awesome. well, a container of cans are supposed to arrive at a yeah. canning line at a certain time and they don't. And the impact is enormous. And Chaos. that really gave me the, 
sort of the conviction to say, look, no one is solving this problem. This problem of just building the the mechanisms to make contracts and like the integrity of these contracts fulfilled, etc. Um, no one was doing it, and it was hard to be done by one side or the other because both sides mm-hmm. essentially like playing a game, and they need to have the sort of independent mechanisms to, to make these things work for both parties without bias. So that's what inspired Mashex. So I love that story, and I, I love the fact that. Um, it came out of the <laughs> the fact that you had to pick up the phone and call the client and be like, you have the most amazing cargo, but we still can't load it on our vessel. <laughs> yeah. And then you were like, I don't want anybody else to have to make a phone call like this. <laughs> yeah, it was it was tough. And you can really feel for people on the other end of that line, right? Because they were planning, they were, they were trusting you. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's it was quite, it was, quite uh, it was personal. It wasn't just like, you know, oh, this is just business, you know, suck it up. It was, uh, it was personal. Well, and, and really understanding and living, it creates that empathy. And if we don't have the empathy of knowing what is happening on either side and the chaos that ensues when something's not, when it's rolled off of a vessel, when it doesn't leave on time, when it's delayed, et cetera, et cetera, not really knowing that domino effect, um, really, keeps it at arm's length, right? You can't really understand what the other party is going through. And so having that insight into both sides, I can see brought, you know, tremendous success to NYSHEC. So let's dive into some of the challenges facing the shipping industry. I mean, it's always been a notoriously difficult industry, but it's potentially even tougher now, you know, post-pandemic, Things have changed a lot since 2015 when you founded NYSHEX. What does the landscape of shipping industry look like right now? How has it changed? What are the challenges that you and your customers are facing at the moment? So there's there's a lot to unpack there. And I think it's worth just taking a quick step back and then, you know, looking at some of the changes that have led up to this moment. And, um, you know, I think for me, what was fascinating when we, we started piloting NYSHEX back in 2016, we launched in 2017 at the time, most people just completely accepted the fact that contracts, generally speaking, were made to be broken. Right. And there was, uh, there was sort of the, like the accepted logic in the industry. And, you know, of course, when we started, we said, look, can you imagine how much value everyone will get if contracts are sort of adhered to in a more sort of rigorous way, et cetera. And people were like, well, look, let's give it a try. You know, if it works, fantastic. We'll have solved one of the biggest problems that this industry has had for years. And if we don't work, sorry, if it doesn't work, then at least we've learned something. And now we know maybe another approach we should try next time. So that was how we got started. And it was a very sort of novel concept. I remember many people at the time telling me like, this will just never work. People are too stuck in their ways. It's just such an old sort of uh, like <laughs> legacy industry. And for me, what's fascinating is that through the pandemic, and I think even prior to the pandemic, the, the mindset of this industry was starting to change. I think the industry was maturing. I think the sort of industry had moved out of this era of, I would let's call it like price wars and intense competition and resulting in all this consolidation in this industry. And, and you know, the mindset of the, it's certainly on the carrier side, was really focused on just driving unit cost and, and everything else. And it's now started to shift prior to the pandemic. And then, of course, the pandemic comes and it really accentuated the importance of supply chain and supply yeah. chain resilience. And it's not just about continuing squeezing down your landed cost. It's really about building your supply chain, because we all know now that, you know, saving a few dollars on the ocean freight is not worth the consequences if you don't have your goods in time for a sale or what have you in the warehouse or in yeah. the, the, the retail store. So that sort of mindset has shifted. So the industry has changed because it's sort of now passed through this intensive consolidation price war period. And I think the mindset of the shippers have changed. So it's a very, very different um, sort of landscape that we're in at the moment. I think it's positive. I think it's, it's much more sophisticated. I think people are making decisions based on, um, I would say like good data, good logic. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that the, again, a lot of people who are now entering contracts and of course, the focus on supply chain resilience on using data to optimize you know ship systems and and equipment flows etc is is now much more prevalent and so the the need for the the technology around the contract settlement the contract sort of monitoring and performance uh, management etc is is becoming far more um sort of relevant so in the early days the focus on nice was very much on like 
wouldn't it be great if we could change this industry? Now it's really a focus on, okay, we all recognize that this needs to change. How can we provide technology, tools, best practices, standards, et cetera, to help yeah. facilitate this change, which is now, I think, quite well underway. Yeah, and people are looking at their contracts, like they're scrutinizing them, right? Because they have to now. They were caught yeah. in so many different ways throughout the pandemic that they didn't get caught in before. So many different conversations and, you know, what does the contract actually say? And so people are really looking at that way more closely, don't you think? Absolutely. And and not only are people looking more at their contracts, they're, I think, also looking more at their own business to basically yeah. say, OK, if I sign this contract, can I actually deliver it? Who are all the different people? And a lot of times these people are outside of your immediate span of control. They, they're partners in your supply chain or in your service network if you're a carrier. Yeah. You know, can I make sure that everyone delivers? Can I give people the, the tools and the data and um, the incentives required to make sure everyone toes the line and then the contract yeah. gets delivered as intended? So there's enormous complexity once you start to take these things seriously. But again, this is a, a very positive sort of step in the maturation of the industry, basically. It is. It's, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be in supply chain. It's exciting to watch. So let's take a look at the product from both sides of the coin. Let's start with shippers. What does NYSHEX actually offer shippers? How does it work? What are the benefits? So in terms of just explaining, like, how does the product work itself? I mean, the, the best way to think about NYSHEX is it's it's a it's a data layer it's an, and then on top of that it's an application layer and of course the benefit of it is that it's entirely neutral and um, you know really serving the interests of the the carrier on the sort of supply side and the shipper or the nbocc on the demand side coincidentally nbos can act both on supply and they demand can, yeah so so it's the sort of data layer and application layer and the data part is perhaps the most complicated part because of course, just think about this for a second. If you've got a very simple contract, 10 origins, 10 destinations, that's 100 permutations. And that's, right. imagine it's one container in each one of those permutations each week. That's 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 a lot of permutations, right? That's, you know, 5,200 permutations. And if you think each container has, say, 10 different touch points, you know, the MTE release, the booking confirmed, the container gated, and et cetera, you know, that's another you know, 10x on top of that, you know, 52,000 like data points and permutations that need to be captured to be able to keep track of just what's going on in the life of that contract. And so the first part for us is being able to get all the data into a system in a way that a shipper can look at it and recognize, yes, that's what happened. The carrier can recognize, yes, that's that resembles the data I have and it, 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 matters, it, it matches, it's harmonized. And of course, we can pull in data from schedules, vessel schedules to see if a vessel is shifting or sliding or what have you um, and produce a sort of harmonized, uh, trusted system of record because that's the most important thing. I think yeah. so often people go into the process of entering a contract, something doesn't go according to plan, and then it's very, very difficult to know where the breakdown took place. And most yeah. people start off with the assumption that I'm perfect. It's definitely my counterparty. And they start pointing fingers. Um, and so by having this sort of data, it makes it quite easy for people to tell, okay, whoops, you know what? I failed or my trucker failed to pick up that container in time and gated it on time. Mm -hmm. um, now I know where I need to focus on improving or legitimately the carrier failed to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and now I can have a conversation with the carrier about how do we improve that part of the process. So it removes a lot of the blame game and it puts the sort of focus on, on where it needs to be. So that's sort of the first piece of puzzles, really this like harmonized data layer or the system of record. The second piece is the application layer on top, because of course having data is great, but it's it's quite meaningless unless there's really a way to use that to drive improvements. And so what we've done is built a lot of sort of different workflows um, that trigger based on certain events. And you know some very basic ones, um, you know, for example, some of these contracts that are signed on Nashix are multiple years and they're contingent on a shipper providing a forecast. And so we built these workflows that allow shippers to consolidate all their forecasts, pump them through the system. The carrier gets one view of the forecast, can say yes or no. Um, and all that information sort of flows harmoniously through the system. It's completely transparent, like where the allocations are and where they aren't. And then that feeds into the, um, the contract um, sort of terms and ultimately into the settlement process and workflows around exception handling. So if something went off track, quite frankly, most often we can see exactly where something went off track. And we know that you know, this container should have been picked up by the shipper's trucker on this day, but it, it wasn't. Um, so the system can derive all that. But there are occasions where the reason the container wasn't picked up isn't available in the data. For example, if the trucker went there and tried to pick up the container and looked inside and there was a massive hole in the roof, you know, there's no data to provide, or at least that we captured today, that tells us that. So the shipper can then 
or the trucker can take a photograph of the roof and put it in the application and say, you know what, in this case, I went to pick up the container, but you know, it was damaged and therefore I wasn't able to pick it up. And, and so you know, there's workflows around how to supplement the data in the system with all of this. And then of course, there's workflows around reconciliations at the end of the contract uh, enforcement period, or um, there's, there's all kinds of sort of touch points between the shipper or the carrier where information is gathered and that more comprehensive picture is created, um, allowing both parties to very, I would say, and this is the most important part, harmoniously, yeah. um, amicably move forward and get the contract uh, back on track. And, and a lot of the time, this is basically just taking processes that would have been done, you mentioned in the beginning of the conversation, would have been done over email or an Excel mm -hmm. file or something like that, and just doing it in one shared, very transparent, very objective um, sort of set of technologies. So that's the, the underlying sort of like package of what it is. Um, the value for a shipper really is twofold. The first part is just being able to manage your supply chain in a way that drives greater fulfillment. And we see it all the time. The average contract fulfillment rate in this again is data that's pre-pandemic, it's got worse in the pandemic, is in the region of about 60, 65%. Wow. And we're seeing fulfillment rates through the application in the order of 98%. So a vast improvement from 65-ish to, to 98. And of course, the business impact of that is enormous because you can now plan your supply chain with greater confidence, you've got less variation in your landed cost. And quite frankly, a lot of the feedback we get is actually, it's just, it's so much more pleasant to work on a contract where everyone is using the same sort of song sheet as it were. And yeah. and again, the, the life of a person working in the logistics department isn't a continuous forensic investigation into what happened and who's at fault, <laughs> but rather they can focus on doing fun things like how do I optimize this and, and how do I improve yeah. this part of the process? And uh, takes away a lot of the sort of conflict or the, the he said, she said kind of stuff. So yeah. I would say, broadly speaking, that's what the application does. And that's how the benefits get realized on the, on the shipper side of the equation. Well, and you're limiting misunderstandings, right? Because a lot of times when you didn't have that data or that technology, there would be a lot of misunderstandings. And there was a lot of blame game in the industry pre-pandemic. And so it's, and we're natural problem solvers. So to be able to give us a tool so that we can focus on optimizing, that is fun for supply chain professionals. You oh, know, I the agree. blame game and, and the forensic side of it, like you mentioned, is not fun for supply chain professionals. I mean, if we can, and the other thing too about contracts is it's very legal, like you had mentioned. And for supply chain professionals that don't have a legal background, they don't want to have to deal with that, but they also don't want to deal with the time that it takes to go through all of that. And so if the contracts are done and you can be able to use a technology that understands the contracts and gives you the data and the things that you need to be able to do your job properly, I mean, that's all supply chain professionals want. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, this is this is a tool that, quite frankly, like if I was still working at Maersk or at SAP Miller, this is a tool I would love to have because it would have yeah. taken a lot of the stress and frustration out of the job that I had to do back in the day. So fully, fully agree with the way you summed it up. Yeah, well, let's also just talk a little bit about the impacts of those benefits, because when I was doing the research for this show, according to Sea Intelligence, on-time reliability hit a, a historic low in the third quarter of 2021 falling to 34% from a recent high above 80%. But meanwhile, you know, carriers are imposing record high rates. So it's safe to say that for shippers, reliability, fair, predictable costs have never been more critical right now. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. So before we talk about the, the impact of that, I just have to quickly make a, a clarification. Sure. The role that we play as NYSHEX is really making sure that the carrier and the shipper both do what they committed to do. Um, and there are factors that are well within the control of the shipper and well within the control of the carrier. And those are the ones where typically it creates the breakdown, i.e. the container was supposed to be gated in on time, right. but it didn't, or was supposed to be shipped on board the vessel, but it didn't because the vessel was over, mm -hmm. overloaded or what have you. Um, so those are factors well within control. The supply chain or schedule reliability, which is what I think Sea Intelligence was referring to, is really an, quite an anomaly at the at the time because of the all the congestion outside. You know, take LA, yeah. Long Beach, for example. There were north of 100 vessels out there at certain points when you consider sort of the long backlog. And you know, this just, quite frankly, there's nothing that a carrier or a shipper can really do to avoid that. And in those type of situations, there's very little that NYSHEX can do. Basically, the technology, of course, 
makes it clear where these blockages are taking place, but yeah. it's not really able to fix that piece of the puzzle. So I just want to be very clear that there's a, there's two sort of buckets of things that can cause supply chain disruptions. One is yeah. factors that are completely outside anyone's everyone's control, and there's other factors that are well within control. And of course, there's enormous value by just squeezing down those factors that are uh, well within everyone's control. But you know, just coming back to the question, you know, what is the impact of all this? I mean, it is uh, it is phenomenal. I mean, I saw a quote on BBC News just I think it was I think it was yesterday, um, where Elon Musk was describing two of his uh, Tesla factories is gigantic money furnaces, and the reason why he was describing them as gigantic money furnaces is because they couldn't get the supply chain to work such that there was shortage of goods. Um, or I should say component parts for the manufacture of these uh, the Teslas. And you know, he, he was very explicit in how much this was costing his company. And I think yeah. that just highlights that when a supply chain doesn't work the way it's supposed to, the cost is enormous and it's it costs everyone. It's just complete value destruction. Um, it's just pure waste. And it's such a pity when that happens. And the good thing is there are ways to improve these things. I think that the pandemic has shone a spotlight on a lot of the sort of challenges that everyone in the supply chain has has been facing. And now there's a lot of emphasis on trying to address those challenges. So I think that coming out of the supply chain is as bumpy as it's been, sorry, coming out of the pandemic, as bumpy and disruptive as it's been, I think that it's gonna result in a much more robust, more resilient um, sort of shipping and logistics industry coupled with the supply chain that runs on top of that. And so much innovation. I mean, people are taking a look at their supply chains and really trying to figure out where they're going to make their products or where raw materials are coming from and what does that look like and how do we gain or how do we optimize more our supply chain so still sticking with the shippers talk to us about the integration process and the onboarding process because i know for a lot of supply chain professionals shippers that are looking at new technologies they're like how long is this going to take me what is involved so let's talk about that before we get into the carriers Sure. So on the shipper side, there's two ways to use the application. The first one is if your carrier partner is already using the application, they're fully integrated um, and quite frankly, they're comfortable making contracts where the 96 technology is supporting the process. That's that's the first use case. The other use case is all the carriers that are not in that camp. Um, so we'll tackle the first one first. The, um, in that case, it's when the shipper and the carrier begin the conversation about Okay, what are the terms that we want to put into the contract? How are we going to make sure that this contract is fulfilled? How do how do we make sure that we're accountable and you're accountable right. for your part? You know, that's that's very important to have the conversation about like what type of technology is going to enable this. And and again, if the carriers are already using NiceX, very often they'll say, okay, well, if you prefer to use NiceX as the sort of the settlement platform or what have you, then let's use NiceX as that. And so it's generally very easy um, to get that sort of baked into the, the contract at the time that you're sort of setting up that contract. In that case, the, the good news is the carriers are really loading all the data into the system. For the shipper, it's very easy to be able to see exactly what were the terms of the contract that I agreed to. It breaks down oftentimes rather elaborate legal terms into very clear awesome. machine readable statements <laughs> as to what is the allocation and what is the sort of the lane level um, equipment flow, et cetera. So that's that's the first part large part of that integration is already done it's quite it's quite smooth there is an add-on that if the shipper were to say okay this is fantastic i get a lot of information i can see how i'm performing i can see how my carrier is performing but you know, for argument's sake maybe there's um more value if i can share information about my forecast or information about what bookings i'm requesting um so instead of having to manually look into the system and try and compare where the forecast might differ from what the allocation is now that can be integrated so the shipper has an ability to use our apis or there's other means we have this thing called a data lake um, that this information can be pushed in there so they can really be a harmonious sort of single version of the truth where all that um, information is, is aggregated and both the carrier and the shipper have a sort of a common understanding of, of how that contract is performing so that's the sort of the first flow um, and again it's it's pretty it's pretty straightforward most of the heavy lifting and integration is done on the carrier side up front the second flow is we do have a, a product where we're actually in the process of releasing it now. It's still in beta exciting. and very <laughs> exciting. And where basically a shipper could say, look, I have a contract and it's an existing contract and maybe they're penalties and two-way commitments, maybe they're not, but I just want to 
use the technology, the system of record and the workflows and that application layer I described earlier, just to make sure that everything is managed in one, uh, yeah. one place. And so we now have the ability to ingest that data. We use a third party data aggregator to be able to sort of ingest that information to our system. There still is the ability for the shipper to be able to take their own data, forecast or booking or other data and meld it into the data. We harmonize all of that. And that's, I think, quite beneficial because what it does is it gives um, a visibility into how those committed contracts might be performing compared to non-committed. And then you can start to sort of build a portfolio of um, different contracts based on the different needs within your supply chain, et cetera. Um, but in addition to that, you get all the synergies associated with instead of having emails and Excel files being emailed back and forth, everything can now be done inside the application. Super intuitive, makes it easy to keep eyes on you know, how people are performing internally and externally, not in a negative way, but actually in a very positive way where data can drive process improvements and things like that. So those are the two basic use cases um, that are available today. I am hearing a sigh of relief from the audience and they're not even here right now. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that they've been waiting for something like this for a very long time. And I, it's great to see that NYSHEX is going to, to spearhead that for them. But let's talk about the carrier side of things. How does NYSHEX work for them? What are the benefits or what benefits does the product bring? Just so our shippers can also get an understanding of you know, what it looks like on the other side. Sure. So the, the carrier use case is is very interesting because, of course, you know, carriers need to operate at scale. Um, for yeah. them, it's all about making sure that the ships are properly optimized and utilized, and the equipment flows are moving in the right direction. So for carriers, there's a it's it's a much more sort of macro uh, management sort of process. But of course, at the same time, carriers have a large focus on being able to give their customers a positive experience. A lot of customers are becoming more focused on that customer experience, customer centricity, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a slightly different approach that carriers are taking, but by the same token, it all boils down to exactly the same sort of pipes and plumbing, et cetera. The, the, the cargo needs to flow on those ships. The containers need to be loaded with cargo so that they can flow on their, on their rotations, et cetera. So how does a carrier use NYSHEX? Again, um, like I described when we talked about the first use case, a lot of the carriers are using NYSHEX today where they are basically integrating with us. They're allowing all of their booking confirmation data or their equipment milestone data or their contract data to flow into the system, trusting that um, you know, we're providing that harmonious or uh, harmonized, let's call it that, a system of record, and also supplementing that data with additional information from the shipper, et cetera. So this is enormously valuable for a carrier to have that uh, technology layer um, already sort of pre-developed. It saves the carrier having to go through all the trouble that we've already gone through. There's a, an analogy we often use. It's kind of like a utility. Once it's built, uh, once, use it many times um, versus having every carrier have to go and build it completely for themselves. Yeah. And then, of course, run the risk that some shippers might not want to use that as the system of record. They might want to use something else. And so you have an adoption risk as well. So, you know, that utility of this, like we just talked about earlier, that system of record is enormous. Um, the other component, which I think is valuable for a carrier, is the fact that NYSHEX is neutral. And again, our entire existence is predicated on the fact that we are serving the needs of our carrier and shipper members. And again, NBOCCs can be on both sides of that, of that equation. Um, and so therefore, when a shipper and a carrier make a contract on NYSHEX and the system generates the sort of the outputs that says, okay, it seems like as if this was the cause of the problem on this day in this location, um, there's some degree of trust in that. And I think outside of NYSHEX, we've heard from, from a number of different shippers, even from carriers saying that it feels a little bit like there's a black box. There's a, you know, at the end of a, whatever it is, a month or a quarter, at the end of the contract, there's a report that the carrier produces and says, okay, we performed this and you performed this and there you have it. And, and it, it doesn't feel very transparent, doesn't feel very fair. And um, that, again, can result in a lot of the he said, she said, blame game, back and forth, et cetera. So that neutrality that we provide is, is another very valuable component for the carrier. And then the final piece of this is, again, going back to workflows. You know, for a carrier to be able to service their customers, they need to be able to respond when things go wrong because it, it's inevitable. Yeah. Things are going to go wrong. It's just mm -hmm. the nature of this industry, not necessarily for anyone's fault, but there needs to be a mechanism to deal with these things. And um, typically, without NYSHEX, there's a customer service person or customer experience person on yeah. the carrier who's responsible for reacting to the complaint that they might get from the customer doing the forensic investigation uh, it's a huge lift it creates a lot of frustration sometimes within these organizations that they have to spend all their time on this kind of stuff 
And so by virtue of all the data being in one place and all these workflow layers being built on top of it, and now what we've been able to do for carriers is actually integrate through APIs into their system so that they don't have to awesome. necessarily log out of their system and into our system mm -hmm. to update a reason code. They can do it inside their system and their data are just flowing back and forth. Right. So there's, um, there's a lot of value for a carrier in terms of being able to just leverage this, like we say, the common utility. It's already built. You don't have to go and build it. That means basically you can use whatever IT spend you would have spent on building this to go off and build something that's highly differentiating to your business, et cetera. Um, yeah. And then there's the benefits of trust that your customer can uh, you know, have greater confidence that the data is, is independently verified and there's this workflow that creates efficiency for your own employees, et cetera. And, um, you know, I think one point just to add, you know, we talked about, you know, carriers have a finite amount of capability, capacity, or resource to invest in product innovation and everything else. And, you know, some of this sort of like the block and tackle, the pipes and plumbing, it doesn't, it doesn't require enormous amounts of um, like investment. This is really where there's enormous value from having a common sort of digital infrastructure for this industry versus every carrier trying to build their own. But where carriers, I think, really are innovating and it's super exciting to see is that all the well, I, many of the carriers that we work with are coming up with different types of contract products to fit the needs of their different customer right. segments. Some carriers offer a, a product where there's a degree of flexibility in the contract and others are rather strict. And again, different customers have different needs and some of those products fit their different segments in different ways. And so I think that's really exciting to see innovation taking place on that side. And our job is to make sure that our system is always able to support whatever innovations the carriers are coming up with so yeah. that we can still, again, provide that, like we call it, you know, the pipes and the plumbing of how these contracts get ingested, converted into machine readable terms, and then all the actual data gets reconciled back and forth um, yeah. to provide that sort of system of record. So I hope that all makes like exactly. what you're talking about is collaboration, which is what we've needed in this industry for a long time. And I say collaboration is the future of business all the time. And I think the other big component of that is the trust, is that you are the neutral party, but both parties are trusting that you're bringing them together. Um, and because relationships matter, right? That's what they said at TPM this year. Relationships really do matter and it's people that drive supply chain and it's the technology that enables us to come together to be able to do that and share the data and make sure that we're all successful and we're all optimizing. I think the other thing too for carriers, I just emceed the um, management meeting for HAPAG in Germany and they have a lot of things to think about. <laughs> they have a lot of innovation that they are looking at. They have investments in sustainability and fuel and what does that look like and what does that look like for their vessels. And so they have so much to think about. And so if they can work and partner with somebody like a NYSHEX to really help with the pipes and the plumbing like you were talking about to make it easier and takes one thing off of their plate. I mean, I could just imagine how much you know that means to them, just in um, you know in an environment where there's so many different things that they have to keep on top of and really figure out for the betterment of the industry. So I'm really glad that you shared that. Now, who is your ideal client? I know you've got the carriers and the shippers, but can you walk us through what that looks like? Because I might be sitting in the audience thinking, okay, well, I really like the the sound of this but am I the right client for them? So what does that look like? This is, it's interesting. I mean, actually, I'll tie it back to the point you just made. So trust um, and collaboration. For me, this is, um, this is so paramount. And I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation, again, pre nishex where the intention of the parties, the carrier and the shipper making their contract is good. They want yeah. to fulfill the contract. Okay. There is a genuine good faith effort put into the negotiation, the negotiation of the terms, the, the fulfillment of the contract, et cetera. But it's just hard. It can be very difficult to keep track of everything that's going wrong. And, and when it gets hard, it can get frustration, emotions get in the way, cause a strain on those relationships. So quite frankly, having the, um, the technology that enables the fluid sort of flow of information, the transparency, all of that just serves to your point to build the trust. Right. Coming back to the point on sort of the ideal uh, sort of customer. By the way, we don't call our customers customers. We call them members because okay. technically speaking, the relationship between the shipper and the carrier is the nature of the customer Love relationship. Mm -hmm. But all that said, um, for us, it's it's the shipper and the carrier that really have the intention to make good on the terms that they're agreeing on with their customers. And not everyone is like that, but I'd say the vast majority are. And where they recognize that, okay, so 
what we need is the again the common set of data we need that workflow we need that mechanism that is keeping both of us um, accountable through transparency and fairness neutrality etc i think that's where um, where it really sort of the, the sweet spot would lie you know you might be wondering like oh what about certain segments uh, you know yeah, should i be in right. retail or in agriculture in the early yeah. days of nice we were very focused on agriculture to start off with, and then we expand and went into retail and other segments but quite frankly um, all market segments really do benefit from the technology it's it's a, it's a very fundamental piece of technology it doesn't it's not necessarily segment specific and also from a trade route perspective when we first started off we were very focused on just us exports to asia okay. um, because again when you're a startup it focuses everything and you yeah. really have to prove out the concept etc um, but now we're active on well, last quarter we're active on 14 different trade routes and by the end of wow. uh, this quarter we'll be active globally so there's no real sort of market segmentation uh, limitation and there's no real uh, trade route segmentation it's basically um, you know uh, sort of a global product which is available to everyone now it really just comes down to the mindset is the carrier and the ship and wanting to make a contract where there's the intent to fulfill the contract and are the is the technology what's needed to be able to bring that contract to life and if so then yes we can certainly help absolutely thank you for that picture now i want you to paint us a picture of how you've helped a customer maybe on the shipper side you know what did they come to you with how did your solution provide the benefit to them was there an roi attached to it because if i'm sitting in the audience i also want to picture how your product is going to help me in my business and i want to do that by you know, hearing stories about how you've helped the customer and, and what that impact to their bottom line or the business was. So, yeah, the, the there's so many different cases, and especially on the shipper side of things, because the supply chains and the value of the goods and the sort yeah, of yeah, the yeah. amount of inventory buffer can be quite different. Um, but, you know, I, I love this. This is such a great quote. I'm not sure how much detail I can go into, uh, given the sensitivity okay. of this. But there was a, there was a, um, a member that was using a NYSHEX contract in the build-up to Halloween and they were selling, um, uh, they have these sort of pop-up stores that sell Halloween okay. goods uh, the, the weeks before Halloween. And you know, my kids are great customers of, the, of that uh, that company. And um, anyway, they um, they made a contract on NYSHEX and they made some contracts outside of NYSHEX. And quite frankly, the NYSHEX contracts way outperformed the other contracts because again, there was all the structure and the integrity and everything that goes with it. And I remember at the very end, they made this sort of, they gave us a, a quote and we were able to share it with some of our um, our stakeholders basically said, uh, NYSHEX helped us save Halloween. And um, I was particularly proud of that one. It's hard to quit, quantify the ROI, but certainly when I explained to my children that the reason that Halloween was a success is partly due to the technology that we've uh, given to our carrier and shipper members, um, that felt pretty good. But there are, there are so many different use cases and again, it, it really it, it boils down to how much exposure there is in the supply chain. And there is, I mean, any if you look at the amount of times CEOs in their earnings calls, quarterly earnings calls, are mentioning supply chain bottlenecks, it's significant. And it's a contributing factor of um, A, reduction of margins, and B, also reduction in total sales. Because, of course, if you don't get your goods into warehouse or into the yeah. uh, in front of your customer on time, you lose those sales. So it is, you know, we're talking... So millions and millions, if not billions of dollars worth of waste that gets destroyed in this process. So the value proposition is, um, you know, the components of it that are related to like, oh, well, you can save X amount of days in the average logistics professional's life um, by using the technology. But the real impact comes from if you have a more resilient supply chain, you don't have to worry about that margin compression. You don't have to worry about the lost sales, et cetera. Yeah. The carrier side of things, it's, it, it goes back to th that as well in the sense that, you know, when you're a carrier and you're running a vessel that might be sub-optimized because you, you know, had a container that you expected to show up, but didn't show up, that the value of that space on your ship completely perishes. It's not like, you know, if you're in the world of manufacturing beer, like in my last company, if you don't sell your beer today, you can sell it tomorrow. But if you're a carrier and you have a vessel that's leaving Hong Kong at 5 p.m., um, either that ship is fully used or it's not. And if it's not, the value is destroyed. Right. So, you know, by virtue of being able to use the technology, again, there are all these workflow efficiencies, et cetera. But by the same token, there's this enormous sort of waste reduction of being able to optimize those uh, ships and optimize the equipment flows, et cetera. So there's a, there's a big, a really big uh, return on investment for this. Um, and, you know, we're really excited to be able to play this role in the industry. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, providing that example, right, shows empathy to the carriers as to what they go through when a container doesn't show up, right? You, we don't really think about it. We, 
maybe as supply chain professionals or shippers, but the value of that space. And they have to leave at five o'clock regardless. So I'm glad that you shared that with us. So I don't want to wind this down, but we do. And my last question is kind of about the future. What does the future hold for NYSHEX? And maybe give us some views on what you think the future holds for this industry. <laughs> well, again, I wish I had a crystal ball, but I can tell you from NYSEX at least that you know, we're really excited about the ability for us to get more deeply integrated into the, um, into the data flows and the financial flows in the industry. I think the one thing which is, is very clear is that there is a lack of the basic, let's call it digital infrastructure in, in the world of container shipping. And I think that's because the industry for so many years was stuck in this sort of price war period of consolidation yeah. where the foundations weren't laid the way they were supposed to. So we really are playing a big game of catch up, um, trying to sort of pull these foundations that are so desperately needed to create the efficiencies in the industry. And we're excited because A, it allows us to grow and to create more value for our members. It also allows us to start exploring the financial flows because there's a, again, the contract, generally speaking, is the, um, the 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 nucleus of what will ultimately become the freight invoice. And we all know freight invoices can be quite challenging in this industry. So getting more involved in that um, sort of reconciliation of the invoice against what was agreed to in the contract versus what was actually uh, the performance. Um, so there's, there's enormous value for us to sort of help create for this industry in that area. Um, you know, as it relates to the industry going forward, I think, look, the industry will never be what it was pre-pandemic. I can say that with a great deal of certainty. I might not have a crystal ball, but I'll tell you there are two things that are going to fundamentally change or that are fundamentally changing in this industry. Number one is that um, the industry has sort of broken away from the old like price for war sort of stage. Who knows? It would require, I guess, some sort of additional regulation to go back into an era where there was this, another sort of period of sort of price, aggressive price, uh, pricing behaviors from the different carriers. So I think the sort of industry has come out of that and it's going to start making returns that are going to be more attractive to their shareholders, just like most other industries would. So I think that's something which is fundamentally changing. And then the other fundamental change is the um, shippers are going to start taking supply chain resilience much more seriously. And in the past, I think for years, everyone had just assumed there's always ample capacity and the price of shipping goes only one way and that's down. Of course, that can't always be true. But um, that, I think, is, it, it, it's no longer the prevailing wisdom, at least amongst the people that I'm speaking to the, in, in the industry. And I think people are starting to anticipate that there are plenty of um, potential risks in the supply chain. I mean, most people don't talk about this, but you know, the... IMO 2023 regulations and the sort of the IMO goals for 2020 or 2050 um, or 2040, depending on the carrier and what their aggressive stances are. This yeah. has a fundamental impact on the type of vessels that carriers are sailing. Yeah. And that is going to have a fundamental impact on um, how they structure their fleets and what routes they're able to service. And it's going to have an impact on um, the market for shipping. And, uh, you know, by definition, it will have an impact on supply chains. So there's that's just one example. There's so many others, geopolitics and you name it. Uh, you can think of them. So the point being is I think the mindset of this industry is shifting from one of we can just take it for granted. Um, you don't have to think too hard about it. So now you have to proactively manage the risk associated with your supply chain and supply chain resilience requires a lot of effort. It's not just something that happens by maintaining good relationships with your carrier providers. That's definitely not enough as it perhaps yep. used to have been in the past. Yeah, and it takes technology, it takes people with the knowledge, and there's so many exciting things. And when you think about, you know, those vessels and how they're going to change, I mean, that also comes down to fuel. And where are we going to find the fuel that is going to um, enhance the sustainability goals that everybody has? And who's going to pay for that? Because that was a big discussion that we were having, you know, is the final customer going to pay for that? The freight forwarders, the steamship lines. And so it's really an exciting time to be in the industry and have these conversations and figure it out and collaborate together for the betterment of the future of this industry. And I'm super excited. And so I really enjoyed that conversation. I mean, it's a Likewise. really critical time for the shipping industry as it continues to face evolving trends and challenges, meet those sustainability goals and address post-pandemic impacts. And in this climate, never has reliability, efficiency and cost certainty been more important. Important. So working with a partner like NYSHEX, who are delivering 99% fulfillment of contract, 100% landed cost certainty, all with a focus on collaborative relationships, could 
change the face, not only of individual businesses, but of the entire industry. And it's so exciting. And I'm looking forward to seeing more. If you want to find out more, you can check them out at Nyshex, N-Y-S-H-E-X.com. A massive thanks to Gordon for joining me and to the team at Nyshex for making this episode happen. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. That was awesome. 